Hello everyone, Dr. Shabazz here, and I'm going to present to you a review of the first three chapters. We have an exam on Tuesday, and so I want to help to prepare you for that. Unfortunately, this semester we've had a number of cancellations. We've had two canceled classes, and it's kind of pushed us back just a bit. And I was not able to cover material in chapter three in any great detail. But fortunately for the class, chapter three is basically an overview of economic groupings such as the European Union, NAFTA, ASEAN, Mercosur, Karasam, so on and so forth. These are our regional blocks of countries that have come together in order to increase their leverage. And chapter three also goes through the different types of blocks from a free trade arrangement all the way to an economic union. So during the video presentation, I will go through these different levels of regional groupings. Uh, but where we have gone so far is that in chapter one, we started out talking about what global marketing is or multinational marketing is. Uh, we also looked at the distinction between these different levels, global versus multi-domestic versus domestic. There are differences in the levels of analysis. And of course, we understand that marketing is multifaceted. Remember the diagram I drew on the board, all the different aspects of marketing. But when you go global, you have a different set of factors that emanate out from global. So you've got all the factors like political, legal, economic, financial, social, cultural, technological, competitive, geographic, uh, human resource management, uh, and the like. You have all these factors that you have to control for once you leave this environment and go into another country. So it's actually very complex, but what's important, whether you're domestic or whether you're going overseas, is that we're trying to create value for the consumer. And in chapter one, they mentioned this idea of value. It's under principles of marketing a review, that's on page five, where it talks about value equals benefits divided by price. And price is defined as money, time, and effort. And so they go through that, and you'll hear more of this uh, in the, the video, um, but chapter one is essentially a review in setting the stage for understanding the global marketing environment. They also have management orientations, and we reviewed an article, Theodore Levitt, which I also talk about um, in the video. Chapter two deals with the political systems that or political economic systems that operate in the, econ the global environment. Uh, when you start talking about market capitalism versus socialism versus communism, you have all of these various flavors of political systems. And as we saw in the Cuba case that we talked about in class, it's very important to understand the barriers to entry. I talked about Vietnam and some of the regulations that were required for foreign companies to manage if they were to do business there. And we also saw in the Cuban case that if you are doing business in Cuba, of course in the, in the U.S. sense, we're not at that point yet because the embargo is still in place, but if you're doing business in Cuba, you have to deal more directly with the government in terms of payment of labor and employees because they have their own internal uh, regulatory policy as far as, as labor compensation is, uh, is concerned. But of course, there are some issues with, uh, with that as well. So this was a very interesting example. But then the question rises that if you're able to deal with China and Russia successfully, then 
the rationale would be that you should be able to bring Cuba to the table such that these issues can be worked out. So I thought that was a very, very interesting um, case. Uh, although we uh, are still within the embargo, uh, it is still a, a very, a very interesting case to look at. One of the things in Chapter 2 is they talk about how countries are classified. And they have all these different levels. And most of these levels are based on production and output and income, revenue earned. And so you have the low-income countries. You have the lower middle-income countries, upper middle income. And then you have countries that are considered uh, high income. And many of these uh, countries have relationships. Even even the countries that are rich and those that are poor have relationships. It just tends that the poor countries serve as a vessel of resources for the richer countries, which produce finished goods, uh, capital intensive goods, manufactured goods. So you have this supply chain, global supply chain where countries provide raw materials such as steel, iron ore, copper, or it could be cocoa, cotton, it can be bauxite, nickel, as we saw in the Cuba case. And then these industrial countries then turn those raw materials into finished goods and then they export those to the world market. I must say that a lot has changed a lot has changed uh, over the years in terms of how nations are classified. Not long ago, China was an outsider, was not even part of the WTO, but they joined in 2001, I believe. And 20 years later, they are one of the leading uh, manufacturers. And I think they are the leading manufacturer in terms of uh, output exports. And so a lot can happen in, in two decades, not to mention there are other nations that are also trying to elevate themselves out of the middle income, the lower middle income, and also the, the middle income. Those countries in perhaps Southeast Asia, the Singapore's and the Malaysia's are trying to make progress, not to mention uh, South Korea which uh, is home to a mu big multinational corporation, Samsung. And so you have a changing in how the global economy is set up. So they talk about a trade, trade between nations, and how that's calculated through the balance of payments. Um, and, and so these are things that you should kind of look at. Uh, when you're going through the chapters. Chapter 3, as I said, is a very straightforward chapter, and it's essentially talking about the way nations are situated in terms of regional groupings. Uh, but I'll leave that for the video. But I do want to talk about our schedule just uh, briefly before I uh, start the video. As you can see behind me, we've had two class cancellations. We had one because of the 4.0 learning. Hopefully you're using that. I haven't been uh, checking your notes, but hopefully you're using that as a method uh, for enhancing your comprehension. And then we had a cancellation due to the, the Martin Luther King convocation. We'll also be missing Thursday because of the Black History Month convocation. And, you know, it is what it is. We have missed classes, and this video is designed to help fill in the gap of the class time missed. And hopefully you will be able to review the video uh, in, in its entirety. Uh, as you can see, we have uh, February 4th is our first exam. We're not in class Thursday. And then I will begin to prepare the class for the case study 
uh, which we will have on the 25th. And that is actually the day that we will have a speaker. And what I'm doing is entertaining the idea of having that speaker also participate in the case that I'm going to present um, for the class to, um, to review for that day. Uh, that will be a case that you will submit uh, in terms of the analysis, and uh, it should be a, a very interesting exercise. So that is going to do it, and hopefully uh, you have been able to start preparing. This, this book is fairly easy to read. Uh, it's it's one of the kind of more digestible books uh, to have, and I think it, at least for the first for the first three chapters, there shouldn't be much of a, a problem. Uh, and I do indeed hope that you've purchased the book uh, because you you won't be able to get by merely by the slides. The exam will most likely be multiple choice, and I may have a question that you may have to write a short answer, and I haven't decided fully on the format yet, but um, be prepared uh, if the, the case, um, if it is the case that I present some short uh, questions or short answer questions, you'll be prepared to answer those. Okay, so I'm going to play the video. You'll also notice that I'm wearing something different because this video or the review of the chapters was recorded previously. and uh, But it's still the same material and uh, I'm hoping that it will be of some help to you. So study hard and if you have any questions, make sure that you send me an email and I will respond. You can expect another posting um, I, I sent the post with this link in it, but you can expect another post uh, leading up to Tuesday's exam. Okay, so have a good weekend. Again, study hard, and I'll see you Tuesday. We started the class talking about marketing, and then I drew this diagram and showed you all the different branches of marketing consumer behavior, sales, advertising, supply chain management, and then you, of course, have multinational marketing. In some other classes and some other schools, it is called global marketing, and in other schools, it's called international marketing. And the book we're using, ironically, is global marketing. On page four, it gives a definition of marketing, and that's the AMA definition of marketing. We all know about the marketing mix and the four P's. Uh, that's basic knowledge when you're talking about the principles classes, although there are other models. There's a 5P model, which includes uh, public policy. And there's also a 7P model, which is very different from um, the, the, other, the others. And so you have all of these different models trying to describe marketing activities. You have uh, many different orientations of when you talk about global marketing, multinational marketing, or international marketing. But one of the questions when you talk about going global or globalization is you're talking about the extent to which you standardize a product or service or customize it. That seems to be the central question when you talk about globalization. And so there are a number of options you have. For standardization, you could either standardize your product, standardize your advertising. You can standardize your product. You can customize your advertising. You can customize your product, standardize your advertising, or you can customize both. There's also a fifth option. And that option is you can actually create a new product and have a new advertising strategy. So you actually have five options. And, and those uh, options are covered in global business. We talk about the idea of, of extension, of extending your product with very little adaptation. We also covered 
an article in class, Globalization of Markets. This was a, an article written by Theodore Levitt, and I know it was very difficult reading for some, some of you had expressed that it was difficult to read. And certainly it's not bedtime reading, but it is a must read for anyone who takes a class such as multinational marketing. And in this article, if you haven't read it, you should go through the article. I have uploaded this onto Blackboard so you can get through it as best you can. But one of the, the central arguments of Theodore Levitt is if you look at the first paragraph where he says a powerful force drives the world toward a converging commonality. Converging commonality means coming together and being more uh, homogeneous. And that force is technology. It has proletarianized communication, transport, and travel. So what does this word proletarianized mean? Well, in political science or in history, there was a group of people who sought to overthrow the bourgeoisie. And these, revelation, these revolutions were led by the workers, the Workers' Party in Europe in the 1850s who sought to overthrow the landowners and those who are wealthy. These became known in, when you talk about communist theory, they are called the proletariat. And these proletariats sought the overthrow of the bourgeoisie so that the people can be the, the, um, the owners of running the government and so that there can be some equality uh, amongst uh, those uh, citizens. So technology has leveled the playing field, so to speak. And it has made isolated places and impoverished people eager for moder modernity's allurements. Interesting language. Almost everyone everywhere wants all the things they've ever heard about, seen, or experienced via the new technologies. And I have a few highlights here and just going through um, here. Gone are custom differences in national or regional preferences or regional preference. The globalization of markets is at hand. With that, the multinational commercial world nears its end, and so does the multinational corporation. So he's saying all corporations are going to become global in nature, as opposed to looking at different markets and going into each market and customizing each set of uh, products and, and service offerings to that country's needs. And so that's basically his, his, his premise. But you notice I highlight some words here. Uh, and this, when I first read this article when, during graduate school, I was, I was very annoyed at his choice of language where he used the words modernity. And I actually didn't highlight them in all the places that, in which he used them. Um, but certainly he kept using this word modern. Uh, and then he used below, he used, um, words like darkness, he talked about corrugated huts, and um, used words like primitive and advanced. And these, these are all relative terms that he used. And he used them in the context of uh, looking at uh, Brazil, looking at uh, Nigeria, looking at Iran, you know, as places that exuded darkness. Uh, and it, it, it kind of had this um, air about it of that certain countries are modern and then the other countries are primitive and it kind of annoyed me when I first read it. So he has this word proletarianization that's uh, quite a, a mouthful there. Proletarianization of communication and travel uh, into every crevice of life and certainly there's a lot to be said about how we communicate now. Again it says everywhere every Thing gets more and more like everything else as the world's preferences, preference structure is relentlessly homogenized. Again, using that word uh, homogenized to represent that everything is beginning to converge and to be one. He goes through and he gives a number of examples. He talks about the presence of technology and the way that's 
helping companies reach the economies of scale. He talks about the brilliance of the Model T. And as you know, in uh, history, Henry Ford developed the Model T. And what was unique about the Model T is that it came off the assembly line and all the Model T cars were exactly alike. They were all black and they all had the same features. And so Henry Ford made a comment. He said, you can have any car here as long as it's black. And that was one of those sound bites that you always remember because it was thought that his assembly line model was brilliant and others have sought to replicate it, including McDonald's. And if you've also gone to a 10 minute oil lube, they've taken that model, also the assembly line and getting the cars through 10 minutes, they change your oil and then you're out. So you have the similar ideas of the supply chain that were taken from that old model of Henry Ford. He talks about the hedgehog and the fox, the idea that the fox knows a lot about a great many things and the hedgehog knows everything about one thing, meaning that this hedgehog is this purveyor of standardization and that they want to take one concept and one idea and know everything about that one idea as opposed to knowing a little bit about a lot of things, knowing a little bit about a lot of different countries in terms of positioning your products. So he, he goes on and he continues talking about homogenization and he gives some examples and he talks about uh, failures um, and he mentions uh, examples of this um, Hoover washers in various countries in Europe to make his point. And be that as it may, I think he is uh, correct by saying that technology helps to reach economies of scale. But obviously, not everybody is in total agreement with his premise. And some will say that he perhaps overreached and underestimated the fact that customization still has a place and that these national differences are still very, very important. So that was uh, the article that we uh, that we went over, and uh, I, I would urge you to go through that as, as best you can, and then tr and try as as much as possible to um, get an idea of some of his arguments, so that later on, say if you go to graduate school and you take another course like this, uh, this reading probably will come up because it's one of those must reads for business, specifically marketing. It's a must read. And, and so it would do you good to, to get through that, um, through Theodore Levitt's piece. All right. So glo going global, a lot of things happen after World War II. And in class, I, I, I talked to you about some of the organizations that were created, uh, and uh, when you talk about institutions, uh, obviously there were institutions post World War II, like the IMF, the World Bank, the WTO, and the United Nations, that helped set the tone for the global business uh, environment. And um, these are also uh, part of of what the environment uh, will allow in terms of. Um, entry in, in terms of market entry strategies. So we have this very famous idea in marketing about value. Well, what is value? Well, we know what value is. Value is something that provides us with certain benefits and utilities. And some of the things that we value, as you all have mentioned in class, we value convenience, we value quality, we value durability, we value reasonable costs, high quality, customization. These are values that we uh, look for when we buy products or we have services rendered to us. And with a value chain, a value chain is a series of activities that a company executes in order to deliver that value. If a company doesn't deliver value, they have to go somewhere in the value chain and they have to figure out what the problem is. Is it production? Are we making our products wrong? Um, you look at the feedback that you're getting. Maybe it's the fact that it's your distribution channel. 
that your products are not available in a number of places, or maybe it's your customer service. So you look in the value chain and you figure out where improvements can be made. Your value proposition, perceive value to the customer, the firm's promise. So you're making a promise that you will deliver this durability and convenience and low costs and all the things that we've mentioned, that that's your promise that you're making. When you execute an advertising strategy or you put something on your packaging and you say it's organic or you say it's fresh fruit juice or what have you, you're making a value proposition. And it is up to that customer to determine whether that value has been achieved, whether they're getting that value out of your, your product. So value obviously is very important. Value as determined in the book is benefits over price. So what are the benefits that you're extracting from that product or service and how much did you pay for it? That will determine the, uh, the extent to which you get gain value out of that product or service. And price meaning money, time, effort, etc. This idea of competitive advantage, if we're talking globally. Now, I drew a graphs on the board and talked about exchanging goods or goods being sent from one country to another country because perhaps there are different stages of the, the product life cycle. If you have a surplus in one country, you may look for markets overseas where there are shortages. And then you seek to penetrate those markets and get rid of your, your inventory. We live in an interdependent world, which means that there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of partners in terms of global trade that may offer us the things that we need for production may, may offer them cheaper. And if we globalize, or let's say if we set up factories abroad, that will allow us access to other markets where the product life cycle may be at its intro stage as opposed to the decline stage. So what, if, what are some of these other uh, issues that we find in uh, globalization? Well, here, Jagdish Bigwadi, who wrote In Defense of Globalization, economic globalization constitutes integration of national economies into international economy through trade, direct foreign investment, short-term capital flows, international flows of workers, and humanity generally, and flows of technology. Again, technology is a driving force. Globalization means a lot of things to a lot of people, and there are certainly pros and cons. Some believe globalization is just a natural order of things, and some believe that it threatens to encroach on national culture and, and national uh, economy because you have these very large multinational corporations. So you have a lot of indicators of what globalization means, and some of it has to do with your, the amount of activity overseas, the amount of capital investment, the amount of revenue that you're drawing and the amount of, uh, of the size of your footprint. And these obviously vary. Uh, you can be an international company doing business in perhaps, let's say, one country, but not necessarily be global because you don't have the large footprint. But we know that if you're global, most of your market and revenue can be earned overseas because... In the United States, we only have 310 million people, whereas we have 7 billion people. And most of these multinational corporations in the United States uh, have uh, revenues that exceed what they're earning uh, domestically. We talked about the phenomenon of LeVar Ball and his... Um, uh, kind of expansion of the big baller brand, but pro sports is uh, doing quite a quite a, a good job at globalizing their brand. Uh, we see it happening in an NFL where they're having games overseas. Um, the NBA have their basketball without borders, and of course you have the World Cup baseball tournament that that happens 
And of course, we know soccer is the most popular sport in the world and has a, a large following every four years having the World Cup tournament. And of course, various leagues are sprouting up uh, overseas. So that was a very interesting discussion. I'm still following the uh, the Ball brothers in Lithuania, and I'm watching their games. And, you know, now they're talking about Lonzo Ball is going to be doing a rap concert in Lithuania. So you're combining hip-hop and basketball. And I think it's actually an interesting idea and may gain more visibility, especially if you have some other rappers coming over there doing a, you know, a concert. I think it's a very interesting uh, idea. So we'll just have to see how that plays out. So again, the idea of this competitive advantage going, seeking economies of scale, we would we would agree with Theodore Levitt in on that in that regard that it is a way that you can gain a global footprint and gain a competitive advantage over your uh, those who choose not to, to to go abroad or who may not have the resources. Here you have a comment about uh, Nestle. Uh, Nestle is a Swiss Swiss company, and they talk about focus, you know, being focused in terms of what it is that you're trying to do as a corporation. And uh, but if you look at a company like McDonald's, McDonald's has is a global company, but they have a decidedly um, a, a very intricate strategy in each country they go into. And if you go to their corporate site and you look at all the different countries, then you'll see that they, they have um, different strategies, different menus, different, um, they have um, the stores or restaurants are set up differently. Something in the book that I found very interesting about McDonald's, and they, they mentioned this, uh, this case in terms of how these different designs uh, different ideas actually come from abroad. So, for example, McDonald's is this global brand that we all know. And if you go to France, you go to a McDonald's in France, you know that their restaurants, their McDonald's restaurants, they call McDo, McDo there. That's the nickname. We call it Mickey D's. They call it McDo. But you go to McDonald's and they it's it's like a, a family restaurant where they have real plates, they have silverware, uh, and it's it's like a Denny's or it's like a, an Applebee's. It's a real restaurant. And what they said in on page 14 of the book is that McDonald's restaurants in France don't look like McDonald's restaurants elsewhere. Decor colors are muted and the golden arches are displayed more subtly. After seeing the sales increases posted in France, some American franchisees begin undertaking similar renovations. Thus, you have the reverse flows of innovation, that some of the ideas that McDonald's abroad has undertaken, now the American McDonald's are taking those ideas and making bringing them back to the U.S. So you have uh, obviously very... Uh, different strategies. Moving uh, forward, again, you have this idea of single country marketing strategy, and looking at customization versus uh, the global marketing strategy where you have to decide whether to adapt or standardize and to what extent that you will uh, execute your strategy. Again, this idea of Global localization or glocalization is the word that's sometimes used. Uh, companies have very different strategies in terms of trying to create products to suit that local market, like having dip different toppings on hamburgers, creating new products, uh, and the like that will help uh, win the, the favor of the, lo the local population. Here you have some stats here. I don't know how up to date these are. Now, these might be uh, from a, a few years back, but uh, be that as it may, for U.S. companies, 75% of the total world market for goods and services outside the country. That's where your revenue is, is going to come from. 
Coca-Cola earned 75% of operating income and two-thirds of profit outside of North America. So very interesting comments in terms of uh, the importance of going global. We mentioned uh, ethnocentric orientation. So the idea of ethnocentric, and we talked about this, and believing that your home country is superior to others, or believing that perhaps you and your ethnicity is superior to others. And if we look at Theodore Levitt's article, you can say, well, his article is a bit ethnocentric because he uses modernity in the, in the, the context that you have Western culture, which is going to be the model for all other cultures, because he only mentioned products that come from Western countries as kind of the ideal uh, pursuit of, you know, what modernity is. So obviously you, you have some, some, some ideas there in, in terms of your approach being more standardized because you feel it's better. And, and so why not extend it to, to, to other countries? Polycentric means that you're looking at different strategies. Each country is unique, so you're going to adapt to each country. Regiocentric, you're looking at a different region. The, the caveat I would have here is that even though you're in a, a specific region, like say the European Union, doesn't mean that your strategy is going to be applicable to the entire region. If you look at Europe, Europe is very small, but you've got countries that are very different, very different sizes, very different histories. And so it lends itself to some adaptation, even though you're in the same region. The same is true in Asia. Uh, Asian countries are very different. Vietnam is very different from the Philippines, which is different from Singapore, which is different from Thailand, which is different from China and Japan and South Korea. All these are very different countries. But they're in the same region. So you still have to look at uh, different ideas in, in terms of your regional approach. And then finally, you're geocentric, where you're, the entire world is your market. Here's some of the driving forces, as was mentioned before. And some of these were mentioned by Theodore Levitt. Uh, and this is not to say Theodore Levitt was wrong on everything, but I think he underestimated the power of national brands, national culture, and um, how serious people are about maintaining their own identities. So chapter two is global economic environment. And here you're, you're talking about a number of uh, issues, including political systems. Political economic systems are in, involved in this uh, idea of how economies are run. Uh, we talked about NAFTA and President Trump wants to renegotiate NAFTA because he feels that this country is not benefiting from this regional grouping. Uh, here you have this trend of countries moving, blocking together. And I mentioned that in the last class in chapter three, they have all these regional arrangements. And the idea of creating these regional arrangements is for leverage. And so you can gain um, somewhat of a, an advantage and you can compete with the other regions. It says here, the struggle between capitalism and socialism began in 1917 is over. And I was respectfully disagree with that. I think we still have a debate. And we have a debate because of the rise of China, which is a socialist, um, they have a socialist government, or well, actually a communist government. And uh, they have actually mixed the their centralized planning with capitalism. And they're able to accomplish quite a number of things in terms of economic growth with it. And they're able to support the private sector with their, um, with their economic backing. So if you look at economic systems, you have a, a, a number of different systems. And some of these we have been exposed to in either political science or if you had global business, in chapter three, we talked about these types of systems, monarchy, 
Uh, we talked about author authoritarianism. Uh, you hear about uh, other types of systems uh, that um, you know are prevalent in today's um, global economy. You hear about socialism. Uh, you hear uh, about some uh, mixed uh, systems. Uh, as you can see, we have four here that were mentioned. Market capitalism, which is prided by many Western uh, countries, United States and Western Europe. Centrally planned capitalism, which is pioneered by China. You have market socialism, which is pioneered by Sweden and Norway, which mix the idea of a free market with a, a heavy social safety net with a very graduated tax rate for 40% in some cases. And then you have centrally planned socialism, which is still practiced by countries like North Korea and Cuba. Cuba is slowly but surely becoming more decentralized. So we will look to see how Cuba will develop over a period of time uh, as things begin to open up uh, with um, the U.S. So here you have market capitalism, which is self-correcting. You have uh, firms that compete fairly and you have minimal, you have regulation by the government, but you have minimal intervention by the government. And the government cannot invest directly in, in participants. There are certain rules put into to place to ensure fairness and to ensure that consumers have the choices, uh, a fair choice between the products that are offered by the, uh, the companies. And it is driven by consumers. And you all know supply and demand is um, what we talk about in economics. The government's role is to promote competition and ensure consumer protection so that certain quality standards are met. Centrally planned socialism, they say is the opposite of market capitalism. Perhaps that is so, but there are many different flavors of centrally planned socialism. You had something actually called African socialism, which is a bit different. Uh, you had other types of flavors. You have socialism that is a part of many Western European governments. I had mentioned uh, France and England and Italy have elements of socialism in their government. Also, England included with their labor unions and their, their uh, heavy uh, social safety nets. Uh, are very very prevalent, but centrally planned socialism is what we find in the um, in China and the the old Soviet Union. Uh, India was once a socialist government, but they have uh, in 1991 they went under uh, they decided to go a liberalization process and open up the economy um, very nicely, and now they're experiencing that a tech boom. Centrally planned uh, capitalism is what you would find in some of the Nordic countries. Here you have Sweden, as given as an example, controls two-thirds of all spending. A hybrid of centrally planned capital, uh, so socialism and capitalism is market socialism, whereas the Swedish government plans to move towards privatization, meaning making the industries um, into private hands to increase efficiency. That's what privatization is designed to do. Uh, and when you're assessing economic freedom, you have a, a lot of these factors that will determine the extent to which a country is, um, is, a, is an attractive place to do business. And you, here you have a rankings, and you can find these rankings in different, different um, books, Standard & Poor's, Institutional Investor, uh, World Trade Organization, and I think even some of, some of the others, like the World Bank and IMF, may have these types of indices where you the countries are ranked and their credit scores are ranked and gives you a good idea of the, the environment of uh, a country before you go there to do business. So on page 49, you have low-income countries, and these countries are characterized by uh, gross national income per capita uh, and the levels of their economic uh, structure, uh, which also includes some social issues. We talk about um, not only birth rates, but we talk about infant mortality, maternal mortality, 
literacy rates, access to health care, uh, and the like. So that's on page 49. Page 50 talks about lower middle income countries. They do a little bit better in terms of per capita. So you have India, which is the only brick nation. Now, India is has a very vibrant tech sector, but their income distribution is very uneven. And you still have lots of poor people in India, which is why they are probably still in the lower middle income bracket. Then in the upper middle income, you have some of the other BRIC nations, Brazil, China, and South Africa. But I would be interested to see how long China is considered a middle income country, given the fact that it has an economic engine and they're, they're the world's leading exporter of merchandise. Um, so that's uh, something that uh, remains to be seen. Then you have these countries, newly industrialized economies. These used to be called newly industrialized countries or NICs. This includes a number of different countries, mostly the, the countries that were called the Asian tigers, uh, Singapore, South Korea, Hong Kong, and Taiwan uh, were considered these countries that were tigers or I think the Asians call them the Asian dragons. Um, as you look here, they have other sets of countries uh, that are included under this moniker, NIEs, includes Egypt, Indonesia, which is an oil producing nation, Philippines, service oriented, uh, Mexico and Turkey, which are more diversified in terms of uh, what, what they're able to produce. They talk about some mistaken assumptions of LDCs that poor have no money. Of course, we know that that's not always true. Even in our own country, we see people who buy things that perhaps you might think they shouldn't buy because of a limited income. But they do spend, and they're consumers, and they have money. They have income that they want to spend. And even though it might be on a fancy outfit or a pair of shoes or a fancy car, um, that does not eliminate the fact that there is money that uh, they, they that they spend. The poor will not waste money on non-essential goods. Of course they do. Poor people have pride and they want to buy things as well. That is not to say that it is making a judgment about whether that's a good thing to do or not, but the fact that remains that people in what's called the bottom of the pyramid this is not the same thing as balance of payments, by the way, but it's BOP nonetheless, that people in the bottom of the pyramid do have certain access to skills and use of cell phones and all the technologies that we have come to know uh, today. Then lastly, the high income countries, which I believe we know, you have different groups of countries, the G7, as you can see, there, there's a note here that, um, that, that Russia, their, their membership was suspended in 2014 after it annexed the Crimea Peninsula. And that is something that President Trump uh, kind of had to bite his tongue on because he said that Russia was not going to go into Crimea. And they, they had already been there. It was just the fact that he didn't know that they, they were already there. He was trying to defend uh, President Putin in Russia when in fact that um, that invasion had already occurred. So here's the group of seven, the G7. You have uh, the US, Japan, Germany, France, Britain, Canada, and Italy. Italy is interesting because they've been undergoing a lot of economic um, a lot of economic troubles. So and this typically is going to be the seven democratic, nations who have very prosperous economies. The triad, which I mentioned in class, is those three blocks of powerful uh, groups of nations. Here you have this idea of product saturation. So if we want to talk about potential in, in terms of maybe countries with limited incomes, telephones are, are becoming an essential tool to those on the continent of Africa because as you may know the landlines in Africa were woefully inadequate 
and they simply did not exist. Imagine wiring all of these countries. Uh, when I was a doctoral student, I would read all of these books and I would read these articles about everybody wanted to wire Africa. That was the, the, the thing in that time. We're talking late 90s, early 2000s. But then something happened. Satellites came in Africa, in African countries, were able to leapfrog over the wire, uh, the, the, the wire uh, phase and go directly to uh, wireless and go to cell phones, which uh, obviously is a natural progression, you know, moving from where you don't have any phones and going straight to wireless. So that was a very, very interesting um, uh, case when you look at Africa and you look at uh, many of the products that it is using today. And we see some of these other products and automobiles and computers and how these have grown uh, from country to country. Uh, and you look at the Chinese in uh, one PC per 6,000. Now, as you may know, personal computers are becoming less uh, desired in terms of appliances because you have the rise of the cell phone, which is essentially a computer. So people are moving uh, to other types of devices to get their their content and their data. And, and so that may be part of the reason why you have one PC per 6,000. Uh, so again, you have uh, these different trends in different countries. Here's the BOP I was mentioning in class, balance of payments. Record of all economic transactions between the residents of a country and the rest of the world. So you have the current account, which is basically importing your exports coming in and out. And that determines the extent of your trade deficit and or surplus. So you have a trade deficit when you have more expenditures for imports coming in than revenue for your exports. You have trade trade uh, deficit. If you have more imports and exports in terms of revenue, you have a deficit. If you have more export revenue, then you have import expenditures, then you have a trade surplus. And so this reflects on your current account. So you have a current account deficit, a current account surplus. And this gives you an idea of the activity, the short-term activity of countries in terms of what they're able to to um, uh, the, the type of activity that a country has in terms of the economic, um, the economic viability. If you're running a deficit, sometimes you may want to liquidate some of your capital assets in order to pay for your current account assets. Your current account is more long-term as opposed to your current account, which is short-term. So you may liquidate some aspects of your portfolio. You may liquidate some of your gold. You may liquidate uh, or use some of your currency uh, reserves in order to pay for your current account deficit. A lot of countries will hold hard currencies, such as the dollar, the yen, the euro, and the pound, as a way of leveraging their financial position. Because if you run a deficit, and you can't pay your current account deficit, you might use hard currencies to make up that difference. Now, that's a short-term solution, and you, want, you don't want to deplete your reserves, but sometimes that's done in emergency uh, situations. Here you have um, balance of payments, uh, a sheet that is being um, displayed. This is the U.S. balance of payments between 2009 and 2013. And you can see that America runs an account deficit in all of these years, and it's it's probably uh, around the same now in 2018, maybe a little larger. And uh, you remember at this time, this is during the, uh, the, the Obama era, and uh, President Obama was trying to pare down the debt because of um, the Bush era, where you had the fighting the Iraq war and going into debt 
uh, we're talking trillions of dollars. And so you're having to pare this down. And by the way, this is in millions. So we're talking, um, these figures are in, in, in terms of millions. So you're, you're talking a lot of, um, you're talking a lot of debt here. If you look at the imports here, and then you look at the exports, you can see where the deficit is, is, is coming in. And how does America pay for that deficit? Well, a lot of countries have confidence in America, and so they have good credit. And they can also borrow from dollars from other countries, ironically. They don't want to print more dollars to pay their deficits because they can run into inflation, and that could affect the value of the dollar specifically as it pertains to people abroad who are holding dollars. It can reduce the value of what people are holding, and that could cause them to dump it. You know, if there's a surplus of dollars on the market, it may affect the value, and then people will start dumping your currency once the value tanks. And then that can create um, just more depreciation in the value of the dollar. This idea of foreign exchange, this is global business again. When you trade, there there's an exchange that's made. Goods are trade, and it's basically you're, you're trading debits and credits. And when you trade for goods, you're essentially trading for the other country's currency. Because essentially, you have to, um, uh, when, when you pay for something, those goods come in, you're exchanging your currency for the currency value of the good that you imported. So it's basically an exchange that's created. And there is an exchange risk when you sign contracts abroad. If there's a time gap, a time gap for you to pay for a bill, that time gap can affect the amount of that contract. If you wait and your currency goes depreciates in value, then the amount of money that you need to pay that contract may increase because your currency has depreciated. If it appreciates, then that means the amount of money you need to pay for that contract is less. So it gives you a better uh, position. You can hedge your position by using a forward market, which gives you a future delivery for the monies that you need for that contract and it locks in the rate of exchange so you're not susceptible to exchange rate exposure. Now, the book gives you an idea of, uh, it talks about ex uh, economic exposure. So you could uh, look at that. That's page 65 where it talks about those issues. Uh, but the currency exchange market is very volatile. And you have people that buy and sell currencies for a living. It's called currency speculation, where they might buy $50 million and sell $50 million in a lot of different markets where there's a derivative. You can gain uh, if, if you buy something at, if you buy, uh, let's say, uh, some currency at a certain value, and then that value appreciates, and it can appreciate by 0 0.001, and if it appreciates by that small amount, and you sell those $50 million with that derivative, you're going to make a lot of money. Now, there's something called basis points, and there, there are what's called pips in finance, and you get into all that, uh, and that gives you an idea of just how lucrative uh, international finance can be. But it's also very, very risky, and you have to kind of know what you're doing. These are also other aspects of global business. So we talked about devaluation. What happens when a country devalues their own currency? Well, it attracts investment. Because let's say a country overseas devalues their currency, then my currency appreciates in value and I can buy more, pay for more labor, buy more assets, buy more maybe foreign stock and other things that draws money into that economy to help, help helps it to grow. So that's the whole idea behind devaluing one's currency. It doesn't always work, but it's a... It's one of those um, uh, kind of methods that one would use in order to um, not only attract investment, 
but it also lowers the uh, your debt and it makes imports more expensive so it deters the purchase of imports that are coming in and, and reduces the overseas debt so that's another uh, method that um, banking institutions if you're in trouble they would encourage you to devalue your own currency and make other types of monetary uh, monetary policies all right foreign exchange dynamics this is a very good chart showing you what will happen if you're in a situation uh, where you have a million dollar contract and they show the various exchange rate levels to the left and what will happen if uh, on a million dollar contract at these exchange rates what the buyer would be paying so you can you know, kind of get a look at this and kind of refresh your memory as to how that worked in global business when we did those currency uh, exchanges let's go to the last chapter and I know we're we're at the hour mark and I just want to bring this in and show you some of some of the groupings so for this one this is the general agreement on trade and tariffs which was created in 1947 I think I mentioned these organizations and the idea was for the GATT to serve as the referee trade referee and the trade arbiter so that if you have a dispute you can go to the uh, the GATT and you can get these disputes trade disputes resolved this was replaced by the WTO in 1995 which also included um, regulating intellectual property and agricultural subsidies and textiles and um, so basically it was strengthened it was updated um, to I guess represent that of course things had changed between 1947 and 1945 and in 1995 and they needed to update the strength of what the organization could do so here you have a hierarchy of it says PFTs but I believe that should be PTAs preferential trade agreements which is um, varying levels of interconnection so at the base you have the free trade agreement which is which you have with NAFTA which basically abolishes tariff barriers that's all it does a customs union which is the next level abolish tariff barriers but it also has a uniform policy to ensure that an external a non-member cannot play one against the other the next level common market abolishes tariffs it has a uniform policy and it also allows for factor movements such as labor and goods and uh, but particularly it focuses on labor labor movements so you have a uh, if you're a member of the European Union you only have the passport and then you can travel on the EU passport and so labor moves across border the, the economic union means you abolish tariffs you have a uniform tariff policy you have factor movements of labor going across borders and you have economic and political harmonization and in this case since we're talking about the European Union we're talking about the uniform uh, currency that you, you have this one currency in that um, in that particular group so as we look at some of the groupings this is NAFTA which gives you the population of 473 million 473 million 560 is the population of NAFTA they also give you the uh, the income as you can you can see that uh, America is uh, by far the largest economy in the arrangement which benefits Canada and Mexico because of course lots of disposable income lots of imported products from Canada and in Mexico customs union you have some examples here the common market 
economic union. And again, here you have the creation of a unified central bank, the use of a single currency, common policies on issues such as agriculture, social policy, transportation, competition, and taxation. It requires extensive political unity. Very true. Again, I'll go through some of these. You have many of these different arrangements, and I'm not going to have you to memorize you know, all of these different arrangements, but this just gives you an idea of what some of the arrangements are and what their purposes are. So Mercosur is a, a very uh, well-known common market between five um, South American countries. By the way, there was something proposed called the the uh, Western Hemisphere Free Trade Agreement, which would have included both North and South America, but it was never created. There was some controversy and it was just scrapped. That would have been a very interesting um, arrangement. CARICOM, these are, this is a Caribbean common market. And I may have mentioned the Caribbean Basin Initiative of 20 countries. This was something that came under President Reagan and one of the reasons that it was offered to Caribbean nations was to provide them with an incentive to isolate, further isolate Cuba, which was uh, kind of a, a political, um, kind of a, a political ploy uh, that worked for a while, but, Car uh, but the Car Caribbean Basin Initiative did not yield the benefits uh, because of the fact that you had, uh, you had NAFTA and that a lot of uh, American industries were looking south of the border as opposed to going to the Caribbean in terms of textiles and other types of agricultural products. And, um, and, and so that left the Caribbean countries kind of hanging out the dry. ASEAN plus six, you have uh, many of these other uh, Asian countries that are involved in this block of nations, uh, which is kind of a counterweight to the European Union and the um, uh, and NAFTA, most notably the United States. Singapore I actually passed this building when I was in Singapore uh, last year, and that I was there, and um, very very interesting place. It's a very 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 interesting place, and I would recommend. Um, Going to Singapore and Southeast Asia, and, and and just to see what there what's what's going on there because it's quite um, it's quite impressive. Now, finally, I'll close on this. So this European Union. Um, there's a mistake here. Actually, the Treaty of Rome was 1957 instead of 1958. Uh, but be that as it may. Um, this was a, uh, an effort by the European countries who wanted to, uh, to develop a system that was going to provide them with a counterweight to the United States that they had relied on for uh, many years. I don't like using Wikipedia, to be honest, but um, they, they kind of give you an idea here. You see the Treaty of Rome. Uh, sometimes I use Wikipedia for... Uh, a quick and dirty, but uh, you get an idea of the uh, importance because they they looked at 35 years that it would take for them to create this European economic community. So in 1991, they had a treaty, the Maastricht Treaty, which resulted in 1992, the European um, Union became it was a European uh, economic community it became the European Union and then ten years later they would launch a currency known as the euro and it represents one of the largest blocks in the world as you can see you have 28 nations the United Kingdom you see at the bottom is still a member of the European Union despite the Brexit vote. In 2016, they're still a member until 2019, when they will cease to become a member of 
the European Union. Again, you have many um, blocks in the Middle East. I mentioned the uh, OPEC, which is not really a Middle Eastern bloc because you have many other groups in uh, OPEC, but uh, you have a, a number of different interests in the Middle East, uh, not only because of the oil resource, but because of uh, political territory. And also the presence of Israel that right in the middle of the Middle East. Here you have the Gulf Cooperation Council. In Africa, you have 54 countries, the South Sudan being the, the most recent uh, country. Before that, I believe it was Eritrea. Uh, you have many different groupings. The ECOWAS, as you can see at the bottom, the EAC, the East African Cooperation, and SADC, which is the South, South African Development Community, uh, which are all regional groupings uh, within Africa. And then you have some Northern African um, blocks as well. Même si